Oh, okay. As you probably know, uh, Julian Assange, as well as his colleagues and friends and associates, were extensively surveilled during his time at the embassy. And our next speaker, Andy, is going to talk about procedural and technical details of that surveillance, which is what we are really interested in. That's why the room is full. So, Andy, technical aspects of the surveillance in and around the Ecuadorian Embassy in London. Please give him a warm round of applause. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm holding this talk actually the second time. The first time was on day one, but uh, somehow the video recording got fucked up. Um, I would say CIA, but um, at this early time of the talk, you might think I'm paranoid, but um, well, we can discuss that after my talk again. So, um, the um, to this oh oh fuck. What's up? Open source. Anyone software. here who knows computers? Uh, oh my. Okay, let's do mirror displays. Let's try again. Does this work? <laughs> So um, the presentation does cover some, but no, oh gosh, being awake on day four. This pre presentation does cover some, but not all aspects of the surveillance. Um, there is, of course, stuff happened on the wireless network, on the bound network. Um, there was um, more things going on. There was an ongoing heat in the embassy, which made us think they might be using nanometer waves to look through the walls and from the ceilings above and below and so on. Um, however, we are still getting uh, documentation about other things. Um, so this is like the state of affairs right now. I will probably make a long PDF explaining things with also more details later this year. <clears throat> um, second disclaimer, uh, what I'm presenting you is mostly stuff from a company called Undercover Global. Uh, they, that's a, they are subject to an ongoing lawsuit the owner of the company and CEO has been um, yeah, accepting third party instructions and a lot of money and has been modifying the official protocols and technology used. Uh, he's investigated for violating laws of privacy, secrecy of lawyer as a client, client attorney thingy, um, whatever the English term is bribery, uh, money laundering, and so on. And also the Spanish justice has very officially started an investigation for a spying foreign, foreign intelligence service, namely the CIA. Um, at the time of the presentation right today, however, he's not charged. So um, this is a subject of ongoing things. And of course, we don't have the material from other intelligence services who have been working around the embassy, although we have some indications of what they have been doing. Um, as this is a rather uh, 80 slide plus videos presentation, I thought it's a good idea to give you a rough overview of what this is about. I'm trying to give you the big picture, the embassy overview so that you understand the building, the rooms and so on the so-called Operation Hotel. That was the official task of the company at the time um, to yeah, protect the embassy against people intruding and so on, taking care of the guests. So they had their own terminology. The standard operation procedures in place, the modifications that, as uh, indicated, David Morales instructed or got instructed from US intelligence to do. Um, overview of what they collected on visitors. Then there was a special event in December 2017 when they went actually through the whole embassy to, to identify all kinds of objects. They um, documented every piece of furniture to see where they could include more hidden box and other things and upgrades to the security situation. Um, a short um, thing about what Julian did 
to counter the surveillance and how they countered his countermeasures. And then at the end, uh, something about the term actionable intelligence, which becomes very plastic. Um, the context is, of course, that Julian has um, taken the idea of the hacker ethics that all information should be free, uh, serious to an extent, and has been committed to that, that we could, of course, also say, well, he has won probably one of the highest journalistic prizes being carried out out of a protected embassy. Uh, that's quite uh, a reward and quite a recognition that uh, he and the people in power he exposed had the impression that they don't fit together on the same planet in this situation. Um, <clears throat> however, um, the big picture is to make you understand the historic um, overview of events. So there was an initial phase when he got into the embassy when they were actually unprepared, of course, for him coming in there and they actually had a surveillance camera for um, checking the visitors before they entered the building, but that was more or less it. Then in 2015, this company got engaged and installed a lot of things. Um, there was, however, three different phases, which I want to um, separate here for you to understand when the first phase was under US President Obama and the more left-wing government of Ecuador under President Korea, <clears throat> um, however, right at the beginning of the engagement of Undercover Global uh, for the Ecuadorian Foreign Ministry to protect the embassy, he went to a security uh, conference or however to Las Vegas and presented his little company and the one customer they had. So that's so much about the size of the company. He presented like the one customer, the one project that did that was taking care of the embassy. And of course, quickly found interested parties uh, from the US security environment to boost up his career. Um, and so his buying for third parties started right away. At the beginning, he received payments from a company called Las Vegas Sense that's owned by Sheldon Adelson. He was officially hired to take care of a yacht of Sheldon Adelson, um, although that yacht already had a security team. So there's um, ongoing investigations also where the money came from and so on. Um, however, in phase two, 17, so after some publications had um, upset the US maybe even more, um, and also the Ecuadorian government had changed in mid of, uh, or begin mid of 2017, uh, there started serious modifications of the protocol, not only that he switched to encrypted communication with his employees, with his instructions. Um, he also like pressured uh, from his American friends the wish to have covered audio box, higher resolution cameras, and also cameras in all rooms with audio. Um, we can say pretty sure that this has been done on behalf of the US as the emails he sent to instruct these modifications. We have all those emails. The emails uh, show the IP numbers they have been sending for. The lawyers have analyzed this. So we know that he has been in Virginia Arlington, in uh, Las Vegas, and in other places when he came with these instructions. Also, his language, his English was not very good, and technically he was not very sophisticated, but he sometimes sent instructions in very good English with presentations in detailed technical details that clearly came not from him, uh, which also was obtained. So we are pretty confident in this um, things, what we claim here, I could say. And then there was um, something going on at the end of 2017, which I will explain later. However, I want to point out a completely different thing, um, which might be or might have led to confusion. Um, at April 2018, two things happened. The Ecuadorians, the new government of Ecuador, made a mutual legal assistant agreement with the United States in the investigation against Assange, uh, as they justified it with the interference in the elections, so to give the Ecuadorian like a plausible reason to help them. Um, the cooperation with UC Global was cancelled, also because they were unsatisfied with their quality of their work. And they installed a second company called Prom Security, which is an Ecuadorian company made up by a former colonel of their local intelligence, 
um, which then did the surveillance. And probably that material uh, could more easily be used in any legal proceedings as everything that happened before was plainly illegal. Um, however, the material of that second company uh, landed partly in an extortion attempt against um, WikiLeaks, against Julian, against Christine met these guys with undercover Spanish police, so the current editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks, and that's subject to a lawsuit also, and there is also publications about that. But my presentation is mainly about this first phase until April 2018 to avoid that um, potential confusion. Also, it might be worth to point out that all Julian's belongings, like his computers, his notes, and material, and so on, has all been confiscated by the Ecuadorians and directly given to the United States based on this agreement they made in April 2018. So here you get a um, rough overview of the embassy. It's not the whole building, it's just the flat on the ground floor here on the left side going all the way down that little street on the left where actually Harrods, the, the shopping mall Harrods, has their delivery acceptance um, situation. So this is like from the side view. On the right side, you see the emergency exit of the embassy. Again, side view. And on the right, you see the courtyard. Um, this is the entrance situation. In the building, there's more embassies. The Colombian embassy is right on the right side, for example. And there's one more, which I don't recall which it is. However, you see here the entrance door of the embassy and here the entrance door situation from a different camera perspective. Um, here you would have an overview of the installed cameras uh, before the upgrades in December 2017. Um, so most important is maybe the Sala de Reunion on the upper left side, not on the left corner, but once to the right. That's the meeting room. And here you see that there was only until then one camera. This is where most of the meetings with visitors, with lawyers and so on took place. However, all the green areas do not only indicate you where video surveillance took place, but all the interior ones are exactly the areas Julian was officially allowed to like use, um, including the kitchen on the right side. On the very right button, Habitato in his bed, that's his kind of small uh, sleeping room where he had his bed and, and things. Um, and you would see the entrance situation there. Outside, they also had <coughs> some cameras, which um, they had one 8 megapixel 360 degree monster, which actually made me think I want that as well. As if you, if you, this is here the, the more harmless cameras on the sidewise, but you see here um, the idea of that camera. Um, and that's pretty good. Um, it even catched um, some events, which I will indicate you later. So you get the idea. Harrods is right next, uh, and also right left is this entrance delivery situation. Um, Operation Hotel was the code name of the official security situation. Um, so they had their own terminology. Director was the ambassador, guest was Julian Assange, hotel was the embassy and also they of course had specific processes in place, how regular, how visitors would be accepted. They sometimes in most of the times needed to be signed off by the ambassador. So the ambassador had to allow someone getting into the building in the first place and how they would be treated, how their passports would be checked, their electronics would be taken and so on. Um, there was an official representative of the Ecuadorian intelligence uh, titled the second um, secretary of the ambassador called Gabriela Paiz. She was working in the embassy and officially in charge of taking care of the company's contract and their work. However, she got bribed um, according to statements that are subject to this ongoing lawsuit with 20,000 US dollar in cash per month. She had to travel with her husband um, to some funny places to collect the money to not violate European regulations with carrying cash and not declaring it and so on. <clears throat> so this gives you roughly an idea. And for that money, she like not only accepted the modifications and made it look like that modifications of the protocol were on behalf of Ecuador and not on behalf of the Americans. Uh, she also spied sometimes herself 
as we have seen her with her handbag, with a microphone and all that kind of funny behaviors. Um, the original standard operation procedures in place, as I said, was defined helping against intrusions. Visitors would arrive at the door, show their password, then would be searched with a metal detector and they would have to leave their password and all electronic devices at the security counter in the little lobby. They would sign in into some kind of a diary with name, passport number, date, time of arrival, later sign out with the time of their departure. The guards would bring the visitors afterwards in the conference room, close the door and then copy the passport while the visitors wait. And also there would be daily, monthly and special incidents reports written by the security company delivered to the SENAIN, to the Ecuadorian intelligence. Uh, so from the visitors, what they would have is like who invited them, for what, what date, what time frame, the copy of their passport. Later than that, one of the modifications that was that all of their pages with entry stamps and visas would be photocopied as well. Um, the exact time when they really came, uh, the description by the security guards, how they appeared, maybe if they came alone or with someone or with anything. Um, video footage of the entry situation, the meeting and the departure situation. And as I said, extra incidents. So we would have um, a lot of material of passport copies. And this is an example of the uh, entrance situation from November 16. This is one of the lawyers arriving and you would see he just rang the door, came in, showed his passport, got briefly checked. <clears throat> and finally, on the, on the upper left corner, you see one of the guards doing some upgrades on the cameras. Same time, but that's just how it was there. There was ongoing upgrades. Um, so I don't have to show you the whole video, but the, you get the idea. He's being searched, um, his phone he needs to give them. The guard also briefly checks his bag if there's maybe a recording device. So this was also to prevent that visitors would bring any bugs or recording devices into the meeting. So uh, it was meant to, to do also like protect June on behalf of them. Um, this is uh, like a meeting documentation. This is myself actually, but it's a little boring and also I'm not a fan of incinerating myself. So I brought you the other one, which is the only positive slide I have that's uh, missing in action. The, um, she's a rapper from, lives in the UK, is originally from Sri Lanka, but here you have a cat. So um, that's of course more lovely than meeting boring data journalists, hackers, whatever. Um, the third party modifications for the access to the whole thing started mainly in begin 2017. After also he switched to encrypted communications. Actually, the switching to encrypted communication um, might, by the way, also have to do with a regime change, so to say, in the United States, as the Trump administration was taking in power and they were scared that uh, different departments would interfere with, with them, each other. So it became a little complicated in their own threat modeling, paranoia, however you want to call it. Um, they started to pick up in the middle of the year the original hard disk from the network video recorder every two weeks and bring them first to their office in Spain. Later, Morales would then fly once a month roughly to the United States. Uh, we have his um, flight patterns and, and all the emails and so on. And he would um, yeah, deliver them, as he explained to the staff, to his American friends um, and sending new instructions. Then in December, they made this new cameras uh, installation thing with sound. Um, and they also started to optimize things. For example, there was um, issues with the audio filters and the cameras as Julian had used this white noise generator, which will later be a little bit explained. They needed um, filter configurations. Also, the Americans demanded um, to have a direct access on the streams coming into the office in Spain. So they installed uh, it already in the embassy in a way that there would be two different access layers, uh, one not visible to the Ecuadorians and one only for the Americans. 
Um, <clears throat> we have, this is the one email I have there, I don't even speak Spanish, but where he clearly speaks about the access to the video stream, uh, one for the Ecuadorians, one for themselves, and one for Party X. So the Party X is uh, how he called in the references um, the American intelligence he worked for as well. <clears throat> and then they started to do other things that they, for example, installed a little door phone at the door. So you couldn't just ring the bell and the guy would open the door. You had to actually speak your name. So, and also the guard, which was, there was a little guard desk in the um, lobby area of the building. There would sit a guy, so he would hear your name. They would have your voice sample in the electronic transmission between this little door phone and the counter more or less right behind the door. Um, that was something they did. Then the guards would start to just open the door to take your passport, take it in, close the door again, you would wait outside. And then in that time, he copied your whole passport with all pages and waited for further instructions, <clears throat> then leave you in. Um, they would, the guards would start to photograph or note all emails and IMSIs of mobile devices that they took during your visit. And they would also sometimes take whole bags of visitors and search them and I photograph all items. So I have like three examples of this. This is the mo most harmless, maybe um, national security correspondent of the Washington Post and Nakashima's little collection of devices. It's my own collection with some crypto phones and a camera. And this is Italian journalist Stefania Maurizzi, who, for what reasons, whatever, she travels with all her USB stick collections. And um, <clears throat> I redacted this a little bit, but you can clearly see they took the SIM cards out to photograph the IMSIs uh, of their cards and so on. So they wanted all that. Um, here you get an idea of the um, of the meeting uh, documentations from December 17 on with um, the new cameras, which had also audio. You, you get the idea that the quality has drastically improved. And here I would say, if you would zoom in, you could even read the notes of uh, what they were writing, but, but we'll, we'll know that later. Um, however, that was not enough for them. Um, they had issues, as I said, with the white noise generator he installed for in critical meetings. And they wanted uh, improved audio quality as when you didn't speak loud enough, these cameras being mounted on the ceiling were not good enough. So um, they made this survey uh, to identify all kinds of options for additional hidden microphones and also of the network equipment. So here you see actually where they ended up later, this fire extinguisher played then the main role. He has this PVC uh, bottom thingy. Um, they put some of the plastics out and installed a bug in there that was working beautifully as it was also like from the, from the room level next to the heads of the people speaking in that part of the room. Uh, the only issue they had is that it was a battery-driven model and they had to replace the battery and the SD card, which they did then every 12 hours, 26 minutes, actually. That was the capacity of the thing. Um, but you get the idea. They like looked into all of the things here on the left side. By the way, you see the noise generator. But they looked at all the art objects, all the kitsch stuff, to see uh, what could be suitable be before they identified that the fire extinguisher is just the best thing to do. Um, here you would see that Julian also installed a loudspeaker next to the window. So there was not only one loudspeaker um, above the table for the white noise generator, but also directly at the window. Um, here you see very briefly on the top the loudspeaker over the table. <clears throat> but they also opened during the survey like all the um, electrical wiring things, the light switches and so on, to see if there would be any suitable places. And they also did that in the bathroom number two. Bathroom number two was originally the woman's bathroom, which also had a shower. Um, it was then later more or less Julian's personal bathroom where he also made the most critical meetings with his lawyers and, and associates um, while running the shower, as you would see it in every um, better um, spy movie. 
Um, however, what they did was behind the, the rubbish that you would see here, this box is above the cabinet and slightly behind that cabinet, they had an electrical wiring for the light. So they installed a buck there and they, that didn't require any battery change or whatever that brought ongoing good audio quality. Um, they also went through the kitchen objects and at this point they must have been infected by the WikiLeaks house humor. Um, however, they would bark that kind of thing. Um, the other aspect um, that Morales um, discussed with the staff working in the embassy once when he came back from his travels was that he asked them if they could think about a way where they would accidentally leave one of the doors open so the, the Americans could come in and kidnap him. Uh, he also discussed if they could um, put into some poison into the food or how that, how, what options there would be to poison Julian. However, this thing with the leaving the door accidentally open next to the fact that that's of course, course would be completely illegal like in an embassy of another country to kidnap someone from. But well, this is the Central Intelligence Agency or similar of the United States. What do they care about laws? Um, so what they did was provide a documentation of all the doors, all the locks. They went through the whole thing. Um, to think about how such a kidnapping take place. They even made a little video showing like the way they could move from this emergency exit or from a window and get in. So um, I have this little video and you get here the idea of the, the way it could work. And yes, the reflections allow us to identify the person who did it. But so this is actually just one of three videos we have about this. They also did this for the rooms in the back and so on, as they also considered maybe going through in one of the windows, which would be more easy for them to leave open than a door. Um, so this is still part of that um, plan, um, like name all the doors, windows, identify uh, here some kind of rain tube or whatever, which they could use to uh, maybe come from above, um, label all the windows, so to get an idea. So what they did in 2017 was then this two box, the hidden microphones, uh, and recording devices, and fire extinguisher, and in this behind, above the storage cabinet in the bathroom. And they did installation of high resolution cameras plus hidden microphones. They, however, also discussed that they wanted one more room, and that's the front room where Julian had, uh, it's the former library, where he had a bit of a room, not for visitors, but to work with himself and with his staff. Um, that room was a little bit hard for them to target. They would have to be going through the ambassador's room, which was corresponding to it. So they looked into statographic, um, excuse me, stato whatever, stato microphones um, to watch through the, no, to listen through the wall. Um, in order to do that, the Americans also asked them to take like a spoon or a knife and bring them some, scratch some parts of the wall so that they could identify the material from which the wall was made in order to identify which drilling machine they would have to use. They have extremely slow drilling machines, which you put like in a suitcase next to a wall, and it takes eight hours for three centimeters, but it makes no noise, okay? And that's the way they would um, have used this kind of things. Here again, it's just the places of that hidden microphones. Um, and here is some, as they documented their work, um, here's some video documentation or photographic documentation of the installation of the upgrades of the camera with audio. Um, so this is the upgraded diagram of the camera installation. Um, you would see all the interior cameras are four megapixels now, and the conference room has two. So in both corresponding sides to cover really the whole room. So I don't switch back and forth now between the other slides, but you would have seen that there would still have been small areas of the room which were not covered. This was like full room coverage of wherever he would be allowed to go to. Um, so this noise generator, however, that Julian installed 
made them quite some headache. It worked pretty well. However, um, other people pointed out to me also, and it is true, if you sit in a room with, a, with, with this white noise generator, you get headache. It's not nice. I mean, yes, it works, and it prevents them bugging it, but it's also uh, pretty tough to uh, do that for one, two hours. Um, however, the American friends had issues with it, um, and they already had started to buck uh, the embassy from the outside with laser um, reflecting microphones, meaning the vibrations on the glass of the windows would be used. Um, but as his whiteness generator had a loudspeaker directly to the window, they needed to deal with that, and they instructed to install special stickers which will be, there will be actually in the next days, a police situation. The quadrants have allowed to take one of these stickers. They have a kind of a foam on the one side and a reflecting um, uh, blank side um, that allowed them to do it anyhow. So you would have this thing here. And here, unfortunately, I do not have at this point a very good picture of these stickers itself, but you would see here their documentation that they installed in every window, not only that of the conference room, one of these stickers that allowed them uh, to deal with a laser outside. And actually their outside camera, the eight megapixel monster I mentioned earlier, catched once the Americans on the other side of the street when their curtain was a little bit uh, to the side here with their laser machine. Um, so you get here the idea that is not a camera. Um, there's of course other things that happened as well. This slide is more actually for your entertainment after the rather depressive technical text. They also uh, did sometimes normal things. Um, was not only spying on behalf of the Americans, um, but um, <laughs> Most important and most depressive is actually what happened on end of 2017. End of 2017, the government of Ecuador, the new government had already been elected, but the new government was not in office. So as one of the last steps of the old government to solve his situation, they gave him, they gave Julian Ecuadorian citizenship, they made him a diplomat, and they had pre-agreed with some countries which he could choose from uh, to actually appoint him as a diplomat to one of their other embassies where he would not have that hostile um, environment surrounding it. Uh, on the 21st of December, he met in the embassy the head of the Ecuadorian intelligence, Romy Vallejo. I have one picture from that meeting. The meeting, of course, was completely um, intercepted. The Americans were on high alert. And actually, after he um, used a white nose generator and located himself with a guy slightly away from the fire extinguisher, by knowing or not knowing about it, um, the guards even were asked to like stand uh, in front of the door and listen through the door and stuff. Um, the same night, actually, so this was, as you could see here, the time counter, it's like three, four o'clock in the night, it went on for some time. The next day, they issued the international arrest warrant against Julian. They informed the British, and the British informed the Ecuadorians that they would not accept the appointing of Julian as a diplomat. And so the whole plan was dismissed. And massive police came, like, uh, standing in front of uh, like on this little side street right from it. So this is where the term actionable intelligence has like a direct meaning that you can actually talk to your coffee cup and next moment shit happens. So um, to illustrate that. Um, at the end, I brought you some resource links. Um, this is, as I said, ongoing cases. There will be more material and it will probably make us a little bit of a case study out of it published at Buck Planet. If you are um, interested or willing to support his legal and other situations at the Holland Foundation, which I'm a board member, and that's also what brought me to all these meetings, uh, we do collect money for Julian's defense and also for ongoing aspects of WikiLeaks publications. 
Okay, um, that's for me for, from my side for now. We have a bit of time left for questions and answers, if I just knew how much, like 20 minutes or so. Um, we have about 20 minutes. We will yeah. be taking questions and we have three microphones in the room, so please line up behind them and we take questions from the internet as well. The signal angels will show me. Uh, the sticker? Oh, uh, yes, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Uh, the sticker is on the uh, windows. We're saying like, um, this building is under CCTV, under uh, camera surveillance, and Morales had told his people that, oh, the British law has changed and they would require to have the stickers now, which is, of course, completely ridiculous. Uh, also watching the the cover frame of their outside cameras, like they would have to actually go all over the place there and tell them, oh, by the way, you're on this violence. So, yeah, that was indeed um, remarkable also. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you again for the very insightful talk. Sure. Um, we are taking questions, so stand behind the microphones and please go ahead. Do or we maybe have, we have questions I would, from the internet. I would, at this case, I would not only be open to questions, but also to ideas how to get them out of Belmarsh prison, but just to have it set. Okay, if you have that, <laughs> you know. Um, we're going to take a question from the internet. Yeah, just one more brief question from the inter internet. Um, uh, what is that laser with sticker technology and uh, furthermore, what's its purpose? Uh, so why are they needed? Okay, maybe I wasn't making it clear enough. The stickers would have a reflecting surface to the outside, but the way they're glued to the window would um, somehow detach them from the inside noise. I don't know how it works at this point. In, in that detail lab, we will have one of these stickers in the next weeks and we'll be able to study it. But it somehow seemed to help the Americans with their laser technology to take the audio from the vibration of the voice generated or transported through the glass of the window. Thank you. It appears we have no more questions or everyone is too scared to ask one. We okay. are distributing face masks, if that's the case. Oh uh, yeah, maybe I oh, want yeah. to... There is, there is okay, yeah. someone. Yeah. Hi, but, but... you're brave. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Okay. Um, without revealing your thoughts, um, how did you even get all this uh, information? So the video surveillance cameras and all these details. Well, um, subject to lawyer's advice, my answer is that I'm an investigative journalist and I don't talk about my methods and sources, but um, I leave it up to your fantasy. As I said, this material is subject to an ongoing lawsuit, so it is also in the hands of the Spanish prosecutor. And maybe just very little comment because I discussed this also with Julian and others. Um, I would have to say, it, let's say before I went all too deep into this and actually looked at this material for hours and hours and days, um, I would of course also have called Julian and myself paranoid people, but after uh, I did this, I would call it, well, we had a good situational awareness because that's the more precise terminology um, where we are into. Okay. Um, Thank you. Okay, next question, same microphone. Um, in the beginning you said there are multiple embassies in, inside the building. And my question is, um, the hallway, is it actually part of Great Britain or is it some new, neutral area? Well, no, it's part of Great Britain. Um, so the hallway was just shared uh, among the building tenants, but uh, all of the um, apartments, so to say, in that building are private property, so it's like a shared thing of the building. Uh, that's maybe a better English term, which I don't know. But the um, diplomatic police, which is the maybe better educated part of the British um, hit and run job police guys, 
um, would not be allowed normally to step uh, in the embassy, but in the hallway. They sometimes were in the hallway right in front of the door, so they would also listen to the dialogue when you were talking with the guard about coming in or whatever. And of course, there was, in the first um, months of his stay or even years, there was this ongoing police situation with actually the police that sometimes in winter they must have got a bit cold and they installed a van there saying police conference, um, which was probably suitable for 12 people, had fancy antennas and cameras all over. So they had this ongoing police conference right in front of the building. Thank you. We're going to take a question from the internet now. All right. Um, have you been approached by the CIA or the MI5 or met the police and been asked to cease and desist from talking about their operation against Julian Assange and the embassy itself? Not in a direct way that they talk to me, but I've been subject to what I would call intimidation surveillance. So there is covered surveillance. That's when they are hiding their stuff and you see maybe a camera at a border point or whatever. Intimidation starts for me when I'm, for example, coming in the early morning hours to Airport London Heathrow, um, come to the immigration counter, the guy takes my passport, sees something on the screen, starts to ask me actually the same question three times, but he doesn't even listen to my answers. Like, where are you going? What's your occupation? He's asking it again. And like, you're talking to Maroon or what's going wrong here? Uh, but at some point, I identified, as it happened again and again and again, that after some minutes, he got this Go material, or this Go blink on his screen. And so the guys outside were standing ready to follow me the whole fucking day. Um, and that's what I would call intimidation surveillance. It's not meant to, like, um, like watch me. It's mainly meant to let you know that you are not like here, that we are have you on our eyes, that... We know you're a friend of Julian and so on. So, um, yeah, that was not the pleasant part of my life. Thank you. Uh, microphone <clears throat> one. Uh, yeah, first, thank you. Um, nice talk, very dystopian. Um, I'm just following up on what you just said. Uh, I mean, chances are high that you are under surveillance as well. Uh, what sure. are the personal countermeasures you take and did you check your fire extinguisher? Yeah. Um, actually, I could and should probably at some point um, in the next month hold a separate talk about that. I found a um, physical bug in one of my phones. I have um, all kinds of funny um, coincidences. I was able to actually create traffic jams in one-way streets in European cities at 3 o'clock in the night. And that's um, <laughs> it's quite um, an interesting experience. <clears throat> um, and at some point, you maybe get used to it. You think, well, OK, that's how it is. Um, but of course, it um, is a bit of a loss of quality of life. And also, um, you are becoming a little bit different in your behavior towards other people. But as I said, it's unfortunately, it's situational awareness. So um, you can't be careful enough in such a situation, basically. If you look at it from a balance of um, budget or balance of measures or options point of view, they have an endless astronomy military budget. We have encrypted email, OTR, and maybe crypto firms. Yeah. So basically, my assumption has become that they know what I'm doing and I'm not doing anything illegal anyhow. But the whole case against Julian and after you have studied all this material, which includes the pictures of the bathroom, right? There was an audio bug also in the bathroom area and so on with these cameras. Um, I think for me, it's pretty clear this is not about him having violated any laws. This has nothing to do with law enforcement. This is a political case. This is uh, intimidation. And it is that they want to set that precedent, that they want to actually hang him on the highest tree and let us all wear, don't try to connect the internet with the secrets, as we don't like that. Um, but actually, on the positive side speaking, as I said, um, he has shown with WikiLeaks that it is possible the internet is quite suitable 
to deal and um, to provide more um, aspects of information and knowledge on government secrets actings to all of us. So, um, yes, it comes at a price. Okay, this is getting more dystopian by the minute. But Sorry for that. Let's see if we can go Sorry even for that. scarier. Microphone too. I'm sure there will be other talks about good news. <laughs> oh no, no there mm -hmm. won't. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. The details like, were really important like to see, you know, have a concrete <laughs> image of what surveillance looked like in the embassy. And as you mentioned, um, all what happened was in complicity with the Ecuadorian embassy. Uh, even if also you said that it's not really related to law enforcement, I'm really curious from a legal perspective if there is any way, I and mean, there are like ongoing cases, if there is any way they could get away with it? Uh, are there any things that they can do or defend or argument just to make this okay? I don't know, national security reasons, whatever, not consider it you know, as a violation. Thank you. Okay, so what I can say is that the Spanish lawyers of Julian are currently with high pressure um, also working together with the state prosecutor um, and examine the evidence um, so the um, owner of the company was briefly arrested, he's out on bail, his company compound was searched, um, computers, um, USBs, hard disk were seized and so on. And that's all stuff that's being worked on right now because um, it might be very important for Julian's main extradition case as it clearly demonstrates that the United States um, or some entities of the United States or being located in the United States have violated his ability to prepare his legal defense in a fair way. Uh, and that might be a main argument. However, um, when, and I've been talking a lot with these lawyers, um, like they say things like, like in any normal case, this would be the end. But this is John Assange and the UK government on behalf of the American government, so we'll see what happens. No one expects a fair trial here. And I mean, also the fact that he's kept in solitary confinement for 22 hours a day uh, in a high security prison that's normally for terrorists, organized crime and murders, um, while being none of that, um, shows clearly that this is like not a normal case here. This is, has nothing to do with normal justice. The United Kingdom ignores the United Nations finding on torture um, about his psychological state, as he has been, of course, through a total different journey. For him, it was not only knowing about this surveillance, it was also the unknown of, can I ever expect a fair trial? Well, they, will they want to kill me? Or will it just be orange base jumps in, in Gitmo or whatever? So um, he, of course, um, has issues through that, um, but the U UK ignores, as I said, the United Nations. So. In theory, we should all be outraged um, completely and stand in front of at least British embassies for the moment to, um, do, to demand that his prison conditions are being humanized um, as totally independent from the fact if the court will find him guilty or if the extradition will place, the fear is that he's kind of being killed right now as we speak. Thank you. Microphone two. <coughs> Uh, do you know if that Spanish company is still responsible for the security installation at the Ecuadorian embassy in London? Uh, no, maybe I you missed that slide. They have been um, brought out of the, their, count, their contract has been cancelled in April of 2018 and this other company, Prom Security, took over. Thank you. One and more what, question. What I can also say is that some of the, that's maybe an important aspect, uh, some of the employees of UCI Global, which have been um, working in the embassy and had their eight-hour shifts there, have become protected witnesses of the Spanish uh, justice um, to testify against Morales. They were not happy what they were doing. They understood at some point that this was on behalf of American intelligence violating the official contract they had been working under. So there was some resistance. Um, there is um, the option that some of this resistance also had to do that the owner of the company got a lot of money every month for this, but did not share that money. 
that might have played into it. Uh, but uh, some of these guys also uh, were not happy as they were like sitting in the same uh, rooms with Julian the whole day and talked with him, of course, also. Thank you. One more question from the internet. Hi, mm -hmm. internet people. Um, how do you explain um, the huge effort, besides the intimidation you mentioned towards you, um, uh, that motivates the USA to take, to take these dubious and very ambitious steps? So maybe just to ask one more question uh, too. So how many intelligence officers do, you, officers do you think then are in this room right now? <laughs> Okay, um, so the, the first question was, I'm not sure I fully got it, why they're doing this? Yeah. Um, well, um, I mean, I could uh, also have introduced me the other way. I could have said, I don't need to introduce myself, go to the Miller Report, see page 47. Um, I was uh, suspected um, due to my multiple visits and actually Look, I brought Julian food, I brought him clothing, I brought him computers, USB sticks in like packages, um, all kinds of things. I will never be able to prove what I not brought him due to the amounts of my visits there. So the Washington Post came at some point and said that they had multiple intelligence sources from several countries that I was the person who brought Julian the DNC emails on a USB stick. And I said like, wow, what a bullshit. But as I said, I will never be able to prove that I wasn't doing that. My taking of it is, as I'm in a small foundation called the Holland Foundation, one of the five board members, and actually I'm kind of working in that project area for freedom of information. And I was the contact person to Wikileaks and to Julian for many years. So they maybe just do follow the money and want to kill it. I mean, would not be a surprise that they want to kill like Wikileaks also as a publication agency and not Julian Assange only as a human being. So here you go, one theory. There's of course many others, but I guess they are pretty generous and the budget they have to deal with this is pretty big. So, and of course I'm not the only one that's being followed and so on. Um, the other question was... Yeah, how many intelligence officers do we have here? In this now? room. <laughs> Out there on the stream I see 23 different. In the room, five to eight. I think that guy looks a bit sketchy. He's wearing a headset and he's been, he's been quiet the entire time. Yeah. Yeah, what can I say? I mean, openness protects from, um, from being uh, blackmailed, maybe. That was Vau's uh, idea about it. But um, of course, not all aspects of WikiLeaks can be subject to full disclosures. There's sources to protect, there's people who have lives to protect, uh, who help with all kinds of things. There's journalists to sometimes bring more things from uh, funny sources. So there's all kinds of things that, as a media project, you would want to protect normally. Under the circumstances, however, it's a bit tough. Okay. Thank you. Um, there is a person next to microphone one, and I don't understand if you actually have a question or are you there to just well, an answer. Maybe you have a question. Yeah. Are you CIA? I, I hope not. Then we're not. <laughs> okay, we're not interested. Microphone two. It's a little too brutal, maybe. Okay, thank you. Um, are there actually any diplomatic consequences out of this case? Because like um, the CIA, with the help of the, the British government, kind of violated the, the embassy of Ecuador. So um, like installing cameras is not exactly OK for my understanding in foreign uh, embassies. Well, um, I would <clears throat> think that in any normal European country, there would also be investigation um, like official investigation, maybe even by other embassies in the building and so on after learning these things. The UK seems to have just decided not only to get out of European Union, but also to become more of a colony of the United States if they have not been that all the time. So um, I don't have the impression also with the fact that the current Ecuadorian government is very pro-US. They have allowed uh, military... Uh, uh, installations from the United States in Ecuador. They have made this agreement to help them investigation. Um, so not that I'm aware of. However, this uh, Spanish investigation is probably the strongest thing going on. 
there have been contradicting statements about involvement of um, secret service people, CIA people, um, might be a mixture of both of them. Um, but this is ongoing, and if you, I will, you, you will, uh, this links here is on my own little wiki called OSINT info, uh, where I'm collecting the regular updates coming in from the investigation through the Spanish news and so on. So you will learn more about the case in the next weeks. It's all ongoing. Thank you. Yes. Okay, the guy who's supposedly not CIA go. So I want okay. to make clear that I never received any direct payments from the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, no, but uh, that's, that's, by the way, the nature of them. So I would be very surprised. <laughs> I would be very surprised that we find evidence because one of the core working principles of the intelligence is, of course, deniability. So if you have a situation like this where you see funny money is coming in and funny instructions come in, but you cannot prove who it was. That's exactly the confirmation and so to say the proof because you can't prove it. That's deniability is core of their like way of acting. And I mean, who, who, who by the way, do I'm telling this here? It's not only them. Okay. I always thought you kind of create an invoice for covert spy activity. Yes, yes, they did. They did at some point, but the guy was greedy. Yeah. He he traveled then. What we know is he traveled to Gibraltar, and there might be hidden bank accounts there. And also the way the cash was transferred changed uh, from time to time. So there was um, not all of it seems to have been going directly sh through Sheldon Adelson, but Sheldon Adelson is. Actually, I missed him to put him here on a link. He's a person that was worth checking out. He's uh, a very weird uh, international intelligence um, operator, if I would call him. And he can sue me for that, but he's 92 years old, so he's a cover anyhow just for other people acting. And oh, he so. runs casinos in Las Vegas, in Macau, and other places. He has been running spy operations on Chinese officials in Macau. He has been accused, look Wikipedia, on money laundering uh, from forged US dollar notes printed in Iran with North Korean paper or the other way around, being brought in by Israeli citizen in a funny operation. So um, he's a truly interesting person in this context also. Oh, so I thought you just send it to invoices at cia.gov and then get it paid. Okay. Try um, it. Um, yeah. I'm, Try it. Uh, and, and put the... <laughs> yeah, no, actually, I would also have a lot of funny fantasy about this if this wouldn't be about a friend of mine who's in serious shit. So um, if you could please also apply your fantasy of how we could get out from there, uh, not only to the question of how we deal with the CIA, I would be very thankful to you guys. Okay, thank you. Definitely not try any of that at all. A question from the internet, please. <laughs> the internet asks, um, uh, what will happen to WikiLeaks as an organization in case Assange gets a life sentence? And since I'm not sure this is the last question from the internet, the internet wants to say that it really appreciates your willingness to do the talk again. Um, so thank you for your courage. Okay. Um. So I'm not speaking for WikiLeaks, but I'm in contact with Christian Hirsen. He has this Icelandic name that's hard to pronounce, who's the current editor in chief. And I mean, WikiLeaks is publishing things ongoing. The last publication was actually two days ago on the 27th or something. Um, so they, of course, decided to continue the work also because they think that's the only thing they can do um, to demonstrate also that, um, like, this is a publishing organization um, and uh, they have been working with media partners and so on. So uh, in Iceland, where Christian is officially located, uh, the surrounding environment is anyhow a lot more supportive as the other day, some years ago, when this Kaupting Bank issue, they had a local bank corruption issue and there was a national scandal. It's a small country, 300,000 people. That's a total different environment, and Christian is pretty confident that they um, leave him in peace there and appreciate the work. Um, so that's not the UK, um, but um, for the UK itself, um, well, I cannot speak, and I can also not speak for WikiLeaks. Um, 
If anyone on the internet has good ideas on what to do, as I said, this is maybe um, the phase where we really need to crowdsource our ideas on how to get Julian out of the shed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do we... Do we take a question from the guy who's definitely not CIA? Okay, go. Okay, so we have suspected for a long time that um, there was a secret uh, request for extradition for Julian and that he was under surveillance, but there was no proof until now. So the general public and most journalists um, dismissed this as conspiracy theories. Now that it's out, everyone agrees, okay, that this was obvious. So This was um, situational awareness, yes. Yeah. So how can we help the next Julian, which we are not sure yet that he's definitely under surveillance, um, to yeah, raise awareness of uh, such a situation? Well, um, I mean, in theory, um, as far as I know, um, the publishing activities of WikiLeaks um, are not illegal, have not been illegal, at least, um, yes, there's ongoing investigations, but these ongoing investigations are around the question of how sources were convinced to be a source. So there's this allegation that, for example, Chelsea Manning was instructed to do something in order to submit the stuff in order to publish it later. The publishing itself might have not been illegal. Chazia Manning itself is, as you might know, also in prison again for net, not testifying against Julian about exactly this question. Um, so it's not only the publishing stuff that's being threatened here, yes also, um, but also the treatment of sources and the whole wording surrounding the process of acquiring a source. Um, it's hard for me to like right now come up with like the concept of how this can continue. But obviously we are here at the situation where transparency in governmental affairs um, has um, successfully been demonstrated to be achievable over the internet with the right access to information and data and also being challenged by those in power. And so we better challenge those in power and ensure that uh, democracy based on our ability and our right to know what is happening in our name um, is preserved. Um, how are we going to do that with a country like the, the, the formerly country known as the United States, now Trump is done or whatever? Um, I mean, even for the United Kingdom. But okay, here we are in old Europe, or um, in Germany with all its weird history. Um, there's other countries surrounding us that at least have a constitution based on some human rights. The United Kingdom doesn't even have a constitution based on that. So at least for Germany, France, uh, maybe Italy, Spain, and so on, and, and these countries, I still see that, that we can do something. So this is also a bit of a situation between European and American understanding of governance at all. And we just can't let this happen. I mean, this is not about Julian. This is about our ability to deal with governments or, or if you want to hear it the other way around with the government's abilities to deal with us. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.